It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, my co-host Andy Grabner is with me. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? Not too bad, actually. Now, talking into the right direction of the microphone, I believe people can actually hear me because that was my my problem in the beginning. Yes, you're you're an audio you're you're a performance genius, but not quite an audio yeah. Uh, maestro. Yeah, but, but getting you'll, there. you'll get there, Andy. Yeah, you'll get there. I think so you'll too. Get there. Your voice, I got to just say, I, I, I love when I'm editing the shows, I love hearing you on the microphone instead of the headset. I'm sure the listeners do as well. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, I got the feedback from other listeners, too, that the audio quality definitely increased. They also said the content, the quality of the content didn't get better, but at least the audio quality <laughs> increased. Right? Well, well, I think today's content will will be very, very good because I think it's it's a very... Um, so it's sort of a new topic, one we haven't really covered much, too much yet. Mm-hmm. And I think it could be confusing uh, when you're first getting into it, depending on your level. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce the topic and then introduce our guest, yeah. Mr. Grabner. Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, I want to say thanks to the folks at Deaf Experience in Romania who actually introduced or allowed me to get introduced to Matt Turner, uh, our guest of today. I met him at Deaf Experience in Yash. Uh, a city in the northeast of Romania, where he gave a talk on the life of a packet through Istio. Now, that was very interesting for me because I learned a hell of a lot about uh, network basics and how routing works and how Istio works. And um, that's when I reached out to Matt after the talk and said, hey, there's so much you guys, you know. Um, And then he told me a little bit about his background. But instead of me repeating all the stuff that he said, I just want to hand it over to Matt. And maybe Matt, I know you should be with us right now online. And if you could, you know, introduce yourself, your background, or what you've been doing, what you're doing right now. And then we want to learn more about service meshes, Istio, what else is out there, what people have to know in case they just get started on that topic. Sure. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here. Pleasure to be, uh, to be with you. Can you hear me? Am I talking towards the right microphone? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, sure. good. <laughs> <laughs> I passed the first test, first yeah, piece of expertise. Yeah, um, yeah no, as I say, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, I met Andy in Yash, Romania at uh, Dev Experience, which was a great, great little conference, actually. Lots yeah. of really, really good advanced talks. I actually sat in, in every session um, that I, you know, apart from the one I was presenting, and it was, uh, yeah, really informative. So, so that was a great place to be. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt Turner from London in the UK. Um, I am a software engineer and computer scientist by training. And I guess for the past sort of five years, I've always had an interest in systems. I've always been building servers and Raspberry Pis and, and stuff at home. That's, I guess, you know, the hobby part of my uh, experience with computers. Um, and I guess about five years ago, this DevOps thing started to happen and the infrastructure and the platforms became more important. And I was like, oh, I know that stuff. Um, I thought this was just, you know, a nerdy hobby, but this is this is really relevant now. Um, so I guess I kind of got into that. I did a bit of, uh, you know, old school orchestration or, and uh, management of uh, VMs, these sort of the early lift and shift to, to early cloud when that was OpenStack. Um, and I've kind of followed uh, followed the technology since then. So with Docker, with Kubernetes, um, and now with Istio and the, and the other service meshes, which are kind of at the, the forefront of the cloud native landscape. Cool. So, you know, the service mesh, you just brought it up. And I think Brian actually, you know, asked about this when we kind of prepared for that talk. Uh, can you, you know, give a quick like one-on-one on service meshes and what problems we try to solve with it and how they work? Because uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, part of the audience obviously is aware of it, but just to level set everyone. Yeah. So I guess uh, to, to turn to a service mesh by way of a problem, um, if you think originally that we would have a big, a big monolith, right? Uh, a big, a big hunk of software that was probably written in C++ or Java or PHP, um, and that could be millions of lines of code. Uh, and that thing, you know, that, that, that thing worked. We became quite good at writing those. We have dependency injection systems. We have, you know, modularization, modular loading. Um, and 
uh, you know, we became good at avoiding common anti-patterns, you know, things like inversion of control. Uh, but ultimately, all of your code was was hosted in one big blob, and it ran in one big process. Uh, so although you might have, you know, a, a domain-driven design aggregate that was uh, almost a sort of separate little piece of software to, to another part of the system, to a different namespace, where one wanted to call another, that would just be a function call, right? And, you know, any, any computer science 101 course will tell you, you know, how arguments are actually passed sort of in registers on the CPU. So that was really simple and really fast, and that never failed. But then our systems got bigger and bigger. Uh, we needed more and more scale. Um, and we so we broke that, that monolith up right into microservices. And obviously, there's a bunch of other reasons for that. I, I guess I don't need to explain microservices. You, know, you can then release every service independently and, and whatever else. But there was a tendency to take this monolith and to split it into all these pieces and run each one in a separate container without really ch- fundamentally changing the way that the system worked and the way that communications across these boundaries happened. So what you ended up with was, you know, to give it a glib name, a distributed monolith. Uh, so you had all the same code as before with all the same failure cases that you could have before, but now things that were previously a function call just between one class and another that could never fail uh, now could because they're going across a network and you know Kubernetes might have these two containers on on different sides of the planet. So we needed to to cope with that. We needed to add a bunch of resiliency to cope with this this distributed system that we'd now built. So the early attempts at this were um, libraries like uh, Hystrix and Finnegal from from the Netflix open source stack that people have probably heard of, and they gave your applications uh, facilities on a sort of an, uh, an RPC call like backoffs, like retries, like circuit breakers, timeouts with defaults that kind of thing. So all of these functions mitigated the fact that a network call now might be unreliable. Um, but they were in process, you know, you downloaded a library, you added it to your Maven config, and that was a big hunk of code in each and every copy of the microservice. And you needed to upgrade it and you need to do a rolling upgrade, you know, a rolling update of your thousand lines of, you know, microservice business logic every time this hundred thousand lines of history changed. So what a service mesh does is it takes it takes that functionality, it takes those concepts, and it moves them completely away from your application. It moves them out of the process altogether. So you can imagine if you need um, these kind of retries and timeouts, then you might use a sort of advanced HTTP client on the one side, and you may use uh, you'd set up an HTTP reverse proxy on the other side, like an Nginx. You know, you think your your API gateway has a lot of these functions for you. So what a service mesh does is it takes an HTTP proxy and puts one next to every microservice. So in Kubernetes speak, if you're on Kubernetes and each service is in a pod, then we add this HTTP proxy as as a sidecar, as another container in that pod. And intercept, it intercepts all traffic on the way in and the way out. Um, and you know, in the way on the way in, it'll enforce rate limiting and sort of parallelism constraints and stuff. And on the way out, it'll do circuit breakers and retries and timeouts and everything else. So you get all of these network functions uh, kind of for free, as it was, ambiently from your infrastructure. Uh, you don't have to, certainly don't have to write the code to do them, and you don't even have to sort of vendor in the code to do them. Oh, wow, that's pretty pretty impressive. In a couple of minutes, I think I, I, I finally understand the whole history and actually what 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 problems we are really solving with this. And I think it's, for me, the big aha moment, and I just want to be honest here because I'm, you know, definitely not the expert on this, but, but for me, the big aha moment from from when you explained in the beginning, we had uh, Hystrix and Finnegal, and now we have, you know, the services like Istio is that the first approach was a library that you bake into your code. And then you made an interesting comment where you said, if the library change, you had to redistribute and recompile and redeploy all of your services and obviously, you are taking that burden away by extracting the, the functionality of a service mesh into its own entity, and therefore you completely independent. You don't have to touch your code. The only thing you do is really you're injecting a sidecar into the into the pods. And I think that's obviously that makes much more sense. One question I wanted to get for clarification too, because um, I know you're you're going to about to to run away with this. Um, the one of the way part, parts that was explained to me, and I want to make sure I understand it correctly. Now that I have both of you on the on the, I was going to say on the phone, boy, um, <laughs> it's that I have both of you. Yeah, exactly. It's like we're going to tape that. Um, now that I have both of you here, one of the other benefits that I heard about this, and I just want to make sure I understand it correctly, is that it's also like your services will register themselves with the service mesh, so that you don't have to also tell 
your services where all the other services are. They just call into the service mesh. The service mesh knows the map of that and then routes it to where it's supposed to go. Is that another one of the big benefits of something like a service mesh or did I understand that incorrectly last time? Yeah, yeah, that's that's another big advantage. I mean, there's a few, coming from the history and the problem, there's a few things I missed out. And we, we can talk about the rest, I guess, in due course, but that server discovery is, is definitely a big piece. Um, the, the practicalities of, say, an Istio and Kubernetes system are not quite that the service registers with the service mesh, but it, it effectively works like that. The service mesh gains knowledge of all the services. Uh, yeah, and as you say, you can, uh, a, a service then making a call can use, um, uh, a sort of a short name and a non-qualified domain name or, or some, anything that's DNS compatible, but doesn't have mm-hmm. to be a sort of globally valid you know, FQDN that you will go to the top level name servers and recurse to look up. Uh, you sort of throw this request into the ether with the correct host header and the, the service mesh will get it to the right place. It also understands because it understands um, logical service names like that. And it understands that they're comprised possibly of several instances of the workload. So in Kubernetes speak, you know, you'd have one service with a capital S made of, uh, you know, a couple of deployments, lots and lots of pods. The service mesh can understand physically where they are, which uh, region, which availability zone, which host they're on. And it can start to do things like route to the closest one mm-hmm. uh, for, for performance reasons. Hey, um, talking about performance, uh, because I think this is a question that I heard People ask before when, you know, people presented about Istio and the service meshes in general. So if you're injecting, let's say, an Nginx or a a proxy into every pod, isn't that itself a huge overhead? Isn't that itself like completely, I mean, very much complicating my architecture, even though I don't have to take care of it? But potentially with every microservice, I get another service that sits in front of it. You do, you do. Um, I would hope that it doesn't complicate the architecture too much. I mean, you're right, all of this uh, code and infrastructure is being added. Um, and I guess, that, you know, a big thing I missed out in the introduction is that uh, if you want to be pedantic, a, a service mesh is a mesh of services, right? It's all of these mm-hmm. services talking to each other with this proxy that gives extra features. In order to be able to configure those proxies, you know, in order for them to be able to do the service discovery, um that we just talked about in, in order for them to know what characteristics to apply, they need a control plane. So they need one or more other uh, services that sort of accept high level configuration mm-hmm. documents and then, and then pass that out to the, yeah, to the, the little sidecars. Um, so the architecture, if you look at every detail, it does get more complicated. But as I say, you know, you've dropped Hystrix for all your Java apps. You've dropped mm-hmm. whatever the Python, you know, re- re- all the advanced configuration you're doing to Python requests to try to do the same thing. But it's never quite a parity because they're different, you know, libraries for different languages. Um, so, yes, it is there. Uh, but the the architecture that the user sees, it, sh- it should be completely transparent is my point. Yeah. The, inje- the injection is transparent. The application needs no configuration to know that the service mesh is there. On the performance question, yes, there is there is an implication. Uh, I so there are a bunch of service meshes on the market. Uh, one of the early ones was called Linkerd uh, One, so Linkerd version one. It was basically a middle proxy, so there wasn't actually a, a proxy per service. There was one per per Kubernetes host, and they all shared the same one. Um, that was essentially the Finnegal library wrapped in a little bit more code. Uh, so it was a kind of a single bottleneck. It was on the JVM. It was actually written in Scala. So it was kind of worst case JVM performance. So it had a lot of features, but it, it wasn't fast. Um, the newer service meshes, you know, do, do address that. Um, Istio doesn't use Nginx as a proxy. Actually, it uses a, a newer piece of software called Envoy that came from Lyft, the ride sharing company. So that's written in C++, you know, very deliberately to be, a high performance piece of software it you know it does its own thread scheduling it's got its own rcu subsystem it's obviously a non-garbage collected language uh matt klein the main author has written a bunch of really interesting blogs on the performance tuning and the the trade-offs they've made actually between throughput because you can always just auto scale more pods to get more throughput they've actually traded throughput down to get better latency and to get tighter bounds on the latency so so performance is definitely at the forefront of people's minds and a lot of thoughts gone into it uh, Linkerd is now also on version two, and their proxy is written in Rust, uh, which again is very close to the metal and the garbage collection. Hopefully, lots of performance benefits. 
Uh, but it can't be avoided. You know, we did, we did some empirical measurements uh, sort of nine months ago. Um, and you yeah, take this with a pinch of salt because there's, there's a thousand variables in an experiment like this, but saw about two milliseconds um, per service being added. So one millisecond for, for an Istio system, one millisecond roughly to traverse Envoy, uh, the proxy itself, and actually one millisecond jumping into the kernel and out again a few times to jump through all the IP tables rules that do the the interception because that interception is is transparent. Now, you can mitigate that by, by telling your application about the sidecar, having it send uh, traffic directly there. Then you don't have as many context switches into sort of IP tables and back. Um, but yeah, there will always be a performance in, um, hit. If you're trying to do high frequency trading, maybe it's it's not acceptable for you. Uh, but for, for most other applications, I'd, I'd hope it, it's just a blip in human time. Yeah, I mean, there's always the idea of you can't get something for nothing, right? And it's always the trade-off. Um, one question about the, the performance, the overhead thing, though. I don't know if you saw this. I, I, I came across this a little, actually, not very long ago because it came out in April. Uh, it was a an article by this guy, uh, Michael Clipper, oh, um, yeah. where he benchmarked Istio and Linker DCPU, and he found not on response time, but I think Envoy was about 50% higher in CPU utilization than Linker D. Um, I don't know if you saw that or not, but it's just kind of interesting. But again, that's not necessarily impacting your application. That's more the service mess usage. Um, but yeah, there's always there's always going to be trade offs, right? And I think that's the thing. And you have to look at what those trade offs are for what you're getting. If you're going to go back to managing all those communications manually, now you're paying for all these people to be able to know it, track it, and and be able to keep that configuration up and running, and maybe even have software failures because it's not maintained versus suffering one or two milliseconds extra on a, on a transaction, which is really, as you said, a blip. So yeah, exactly. And what you know, what is the cost of uh, you know of a code path traversing you know a, a thread on your CPU traversing all the way through Hystrix, which you can now remove? Um, but yeah, I think the answer is admit to yourself that you're never going to get a free lunch. Work out what your actual requirements are and, and just test it. Yeah, I'm, I've been following Michael's stuff. I'm a big fan. Uh, he did that initial work, and then he did something more recently, actually, uh, a higher scale, uh, a much higher load, and actually it tipped. Like I actually thought he found that. Envoy was quicker first time in the first set of experiments, but then under, under a lot of load, it was Linkerd or something. I, I can't remember, but he he's found some very interesting stuff. He's he's very methodical about his sort of experimental conditions. If they exactly match your environment, then that's great. If not, they're just an indication. You know, spin up your own load test, work it out, and then yeah, exactly as you say, go and look at what your business value is from this. Go and look at what the opportunity cost is of uh, of not doing this. Look at how much it costs the people. Um, all, all of these other questions that should factor into a big tech decision like this. Yeah, and you are right. He did he did come up with the follow up on May eighth. So definitely. Hey, so quick question here. Um, you mentioned Envoy. So, and you know, obviously, if you Google or Bing or whatever search engine you prefer, if you look for let's say Istio architecture, uh, there's a lot of great overview pictures. And I know Matt, and we'll add these to the links uh, for the podcast proceedings. You have a lot of lectures out there and and articles uh, that you did and presentations on on Eastern for for beginners to advanced people. But if you look at the architecture, then you see Envoy being obviously injected into the pods um, as a proxy to intercept all the traffic. Now you mentioned earlier there's a control plane kind of on top of it. And uh, I, could you explain a little bit more about what makes up the control plane so people are a little bit more aware of when they hear, you know, things like pilot, mixer, and authenticator? Yeah. So I guess I guess what I'll talk about is Istio in the setting of running in a Kubernetes cluster, because that's almost always what's written about, almost always how it's used. Istio can run outside of Kubernetes, but you have to do a lot of stuff yourself. It gets quite complicated. Um, in Kubernetes, uh, as, as I'll talk about, um, some parts of Kubernetes are leveraged to, to sort of help control things as well. Um, but so basically, yeah, you've got the, the Envoy proxy as a sidecar to every service, which means that every Kubernetes pod has another container running Envoy. Envoy is quite a modern piece of software, so it takes configuration uh, over an API um, you know, not off a hot reloading file on disk. So Envoy is a nice little thing that's sitting there waiting to be configured, but but something needs to to tell it what to do. And you don't want that to be you because it would be super complicated. Uh, so there's this control plane with which you interact and you give it higher level configuration uh, and it tells all the Envoys what to do. So the there are sort of three or four components, five, six, depends how you want to look at it. Um, but the three major ones, the first one is this thing called Pilot, Pilot is basically the configuration 
system, the sort of configuration compiler, if you like. So if I want Istio to implement a um, fault injection, 10% 500s, right, for chaos, then I write a YAML file. looks a lot like a Kubernetes YAML file. I write a, uh, an Istio YAML file uh, to an Istio schema that, that tells Istio that I want a, a fault injection and the return code should be 500 and it should be 10% of the time or, or whatever. I submit that to Istio. Pilot then um, effectively tr- compiles that, transpiles that into the configuration format that Envoy wants, which is a, a different document form, and it sends that down to, to every Envoy to tell it what to do. Where the integration with something like Kubernetes comes in is, is what we were talking about earlier, say service discovery. Um, the sidecars don't actually sort of call in and register with the mesh. What actually happens is Pilot goes and talks to Kubernetes. It says, well, I'm running in a Kubernetes cluster, and I want to know about all the different pods, all the different workloads. Well, all I need to really do is effectively kubectl get pods against that sort of local Kubernetes API server. So it does that. So it takes in configuration from, it takes in service discovery information from a bunch of places, including Kubernetes, and it takes in all the extra configuration documents that you give it to give it any kind of non-default settings, and it uh, compiles them and it pushes them out to all the envoys. Mm -hmm. The next component is uh, something called Mixer. So where Pilot is for sort of upfront configuration, the kind of thing that you you would write into a config file if you were configuring it manually, Mixer is like um, online decision-making. So say I've got a rate limit. Say I've got three copies of the pod for service A, and I want a 1,000 QPS rate limit across all of them because maybe they all call off to the same database behind the scenes. So I can you know, I can scale to as many as I want, um, but that doesn't help the, the bottleneck in my system, which is this one database. So I can have one or three or 5,000 know, copies of the service A pod, and they only really can take a 1,000 QPS between them because each time I touch one, it calls the database say. That kind of rate limit can't you know, be pre-programmed into a configuration file. E- each envoy could get configuration saying, well, your local rate limit is 1,000. But if you want that kind of global coordination, then you need effectively a global counter, right? a global histogram bucket. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that Mixer provides. So there's a very tight communication loop between the envoys and Mixer. So for something like a rate limit or for whitelist, blacklist policy, every time there's a request, the envoy sidecar will call to Mixer and say, hey, is this okay? And Mixer will check its its rate limit bucket or its its you know up to date policy list or something, and it'll give a reply. The other, I guess, fairly big feature that I missed out in the introduction to Istio um, is the the observatory, the telemetry that you get for free. So because all of these proxies are on the wire and they're they're handling you know actually passing through every network um, transaction. They can produce a log at each one, and they can produce metrics about all of the, you know, all of the different characteristics and all of the rates. They can produce trace bands uh, if trace headers are being propagated. Again, all of that stuff that you'd have to import, like a Zipkin or a Jaeger client library, to do, and then wire up of your web frameworks logging and all of that stuff. If you've got this proxy on this universal proxy on the wire next to everything, Istio can totally do that for free. And the way that works is through Mixer. So Envoy tells Mixer sort of the raw, it basically sends it the headers of the of the transaction that's gone through. Um, and then Mixer will uh, send that. You, Mixer is configurable. So you can say, all right, I've got a Prometheus server over there and an older Graphite server over there. Both of those want metrics. And my logging server is Elastic Stash over there and, uh, and, and so forth. So, so that's what Mixer does. It's a central aggregation point for, for sort of real-time policy and for observability. The next major component is uh, a thing called Citadel. So that deals with the security. Um, the Istio sidecars can give you mutual TLS between all your pods. So if you think about a normal microservices setup, you tend to either not do TLS, you just do an HTTP, um, plain HTTP call between pods, and you sort of make an argument about defense in depth, saying, well, I'm in a Kubernetes overlay network in a VPC, it's fine. Um, but MTLS certainly doesn't doesn't hurt. You know, or, or you would do TLS by giving, again, giving Netty some certificates and maybe you get one-way TLS and you kind of bake these things in when you build the application and they expire after a year and they never get rotated. All of those are sort of bad security practices. So Istio can, do, can set up the TLS tunnels for you. 
uh, mutual TLS, so a, a verification of, of both ends, short-lived certificates that are regularly cycled. All of this stuff is totally possible manually, right? You just have to write the code. Um, so Istio has done that for you, and Citadel is the, is the component that mints those certificates and issues them or rotates them. Those are kind of, there's another couple of things that are sort of down in the weeds of making the system work. They're probably not that important. I guess the only other thing I'd mention is the sidecar injector. Um, so this isn't really an Istio component. This is leaning on a Kubernetes feature, a mutating webhook admission controller, if anybody's familiar with those, um, which basically says, again, that the developer experience gets to be better. So as a, as a developer or an operator, I write a Kubernetes YAML file saying, this is my deployment, and all of my pods have one container in them, which is my application code. You don't mention the sidecar. You don't have to know it's going to be there. And when that YAML document is submitted to the Kubernetes API server, this mutating webhook emission controller uh, modifies that document and says, oh, I'm going to add a, another container to the containers list in the pod spec, which is the Istio sidecar container. Uh, and as I say, that's, that's free and that's transparent and that's done on a Kubernetes system by Istio um, hooking this powerful Kubernetes feature. Pretty cool. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for the overview. I mean, that was, I think, at least for me, I mean, also looking at the architectural diagrams, I can I, I suggest people that are listening to this and maybe listening to this again, just open up the architectural diagram because it really makes a lot of sense the way you explain it. Um, I also like a lot, you know, the, the flexibility that Mixer gives you um, and uh, obviously then implementing or, or enabling a lot of the features we I think we all need to think about when in large distributed systems, uh, you know, everything that around traffic control, as you said earlier, enforcing rate limits uh, and all that stuff. Um, now, we didn't just introduce or invite you just to give a, a quick overview of, of Istio. I think I also want to learn from you, especially with, with the work you do right now, because I think you help organizations, um, you know, with, with, with Istio and, and with, with microservice architectures. Can you... Maybe give us give us a little insight in what are people struggling with, uh, what are the problems people face, uh, what should people you know be be aware of when they go down that road of a service mesh, uh, or in particular with with Istio. Why would they also maybe reach out to you again and ask for more from a feedback? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so briefly, what I do is I'm CTO at a uh, cloud native consultancy in London called Native Wave. Uh, and as you say, what we do is we help organizations that are looking to to become cloud native. Uh, so organizations that are looking to take whatever uh, software stack they've got and, and move it to a public cloud. And the, the reason, you know, the reasons they do that are are varied, but they they're always looking to get a hold of at least one of the advantages of of public cloud and cloud native computing right that, that we all that we all know about um, the thing is it's it's very complicated there's a lot of it I mean if you've seen the sort of CNCF landscape map recently you know it's now you can't read the logos on one page there's there's so much there um, so people people have uh, kind of been tuned in for the last few years they've heard that there are all these massive advantages and we've just talked about what istio can do and i think it's got a, a bunch of great features that people will benefit from um but organizations especially organizations that weren't weren't born in the cloud you know they struggle to know which of these things they want and they struggle to know how to get there and the kind of depth of knowledge that you need to run uh istio or to run kubernetes or to run vault or, or you know any and all of these systems at production sort of you know, scale and reliability is is really deep. So I, I think we see organizations that don't want to go and simply don't have the, the capacity to go and learn all of this stuff for all of these products and then take a, you know, take a decision about what they should use. So it's okay for me to, you know, go to a conference and say, you should use Istio, it's great. But that means that, you know, you in order to, to to know that it's doing the right thing and not breaking your application, you need the monitoring set up properly, right? It, if you run Prometheus at scale, it's not that easy. Um, and that, you know, relies on a working Kubernetes cluster, which relies on, on all this other stuff. Um, yeah. So to your point about when people should use it, you know, well, well what problems people have adopting it, it is often seen as the, the last step in the adoption of all of these sort of cloud native technologies, um, which can be a long way down the road for a lot of people who are maybe just starting with Docker or just starting with one of the cloud providers. Um, and it could be quite a daunting thing to sort of, sort of build up to. So we really go in and sort of help organizations, um, cut through all of the, 
uh, all of the vendor pitches maybe and work out what technology they need. And then we help them design what, you know, the right stack for them would look like. Uh, and obviously we can, we can help build it. And actually we have a managed service platform as well. So we, we can just help host it as well. You, you know, you can outsource your IT function to us, which is what we see a lot of companies really, really wanting to do. So they get all the benefits of the latest cutting edge cloud native technologies because, you know, we are experts in that, and, you know, not because we're particularly clever, but because these are the kind of conferences and podcasts that we spend our time at. Uh, and then the idea is that the, the developers in the, in the companies can just finally live, live that dream of focusing on their business logic, right? They write these 1000 line microservices that don't have to care about where they run or what their network is or whether things are on fire. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what we saw in the market, and that's why we've decided to do what we do. So it's great for me. I get to learn about all this stuff, bring it to the table, build the best platform I can, um, and hopefully other people get the advantages of this stuff without the pain. Yeah, and we also, I mean, I think we talked about this in Yash at the conference that uh, here within Dynatrace, we just started an open source project called Captain, where we are also using Istio uh, for traffic control. When we do blue-green deployments or any type of deployment strategy, uh, then we are using Istio. And Captain is automatically configuring Istio and creating all the helm charts and putting it into Git. So there's also a lot of lessons learned uh, when we you know, played around with this latest and greatest technology. And, and really our hope is to provide a platform that really allows these these teams and organizations to really, uh, let's say, benefit from from what cloud native promises, which is focus on your code, write your microservice, deploy it, and let the cloud native frameworks that are out there, you know, handle all the tough work, whether it's traffic routing, uh, whether it is the different type of deployment models, whether it's scaling up, scaling down, and things like that. But um, I mean, the way we learned it, and I'm sure you you've learned it as well. It's if you go down to the weeds, it's really it, there's a lot to it, and it's it's not as easy as as it as it looks like sometimes. But we at least you and now we also we try to make it easier by by figuring out what are the best practices and then combining the right tools and providing a good service on top of it or a good framework. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope so. And everybody has their specialism, right? I'm sure you learn a lot about Istio, you know, a lot more mm-hmm. than you you claim to know. I'm sure sure you learn no lows from writing Captain. Um, because obviously it, uh, it has to lean heavily on Istio. Oh, I'm super, super excited about the Captain project. I think it's great. I think it's almost the last missing piece on, to, on top of that stack that we've been talking about, right, that actually gives developers uh, an interface where they can do what they want, which is here are the three versions of my software that I care about at the moment. I want an A-B test between this, and I want an automatic rollback if it blows up during the middle of the night, right? So Istio provides all of the primitives for that, um, mm-hmm. But again, it's you'd have, you'd be sitting there pushing a lot of configuration documents, even at Istio's level of abstraction, if you wanted mm-hmm. to do that. So I'm I'm super excited about uh, about Captain bringing that to the table and automating it. Yeah. Hey. So I know you're tight on time, I believe, because you have, you're actually right now um, somewhere in the you know in Europe and, and at a conference. But um, I got a question for you. So the um, when let's say. When is it maybe not a good idea to think about these things? When is it, or what are the what are the minimum requirements from an architectural perspective from your app to uh, to look into something like a service mesh? When is it not smart to walk down that road? Because I think knowing when it's not smart is just as good as knowing when it is smart. Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? I guess I would say you know don't don't do science projects, don't over engineer more than you need to. Um, yeah, the the a number of people have have come to me because I talk about this stuff or to Native Wave and said, "Oh, we we want Kubernetes. Can you help?" And I've said, "Why?" And they said, "Oh, well, because it's I've heard of it. It's got all these advantages and all these features." And I say, "Right, how many services you've got? Oh, three. Okay, and what kind of load are you are you at? Oh, you're pre-release. Okay, so actually, you know, uh, a Docker Compose file would be just fine." Right, and you mm-hmm. use a you, two EC2 instances, so you've got a backup. That's it's it's certainly not perfect. We could all sit here and pick holes in that all day, but it's going to work, and it's going to work at that scale, and it's going to be totally good enough. The you know, the opportunity cost of sitting down for nine months and building a perfect platform is nine months where you're not writing your application code, where you're not going to market and um, getting feedback and raising funding and and all of that good stuff. Um, so I think don't build, you know, as, as ever, don't build more than you need. Mm-hmm. 
the thing about service mesh is just they are really useful. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go multi-region in your cloud provider or even go to, to Kubernetes and, until it's ready, until you've got time. I wouldn't even necessarily do microservices until, you know, until you really have a need and until you actually do have sort of scale, real scale or real, um, you know, development velocity problems. And as I said at the beginning, we are, we are actually quite good at, you know, our IDEs and our tools and our frameworks make us quite good at mm-hmm. writing fairly large pieces of code. Um, but if you are going to be calling across a network, I really do think you need these kind of features. Now, if you're in one language, yeah, you 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 could use an in process library. There are there are you know libraries for for Go and for Python and, and, and other languages like that. Um, if you're starting from scratch, right? If you're sort of born in the cloud, then I, I would actually be really tempted to put a to get a, get a managed Kubernetes cluster. It, it, it's a folly to run Kubernetes yourself. I don't know why anybody does, but get a managed Kubernetes cluster, install Istio or LinkerD two into it. It's you know it's really quite simple these days. Turn the chaos on from day one. So turn Chaos Cube on and turn the Istio stuff on from day one. Um, I and so you know. Do software development properly. Do continuous delivery from day one under these simulated conditions of chaos, and then everything will be lovely. Um, and I, I really would go to a service mesh quite early if you're starting from scratch. I just think they're they're so valuable. Um, mm-hmm. The one thing that does put people off is you, they build on top of this other stack of stuff that you need, which I admit is a is a a problem. I don't have a perfect solution for it, other than to say that now you know getting a managed Kubernetes cluster. Um, sort of one of the major cloud providers is really a case of a, f- of a few clicks. So hopefully it's not that hard. Um, as for when not to do it, uh, you know, if you have a big Brownfield legacy site, um, uh, trying to shove one of these things in may cause you, you know, may cause you a bit of pain. It may not be what you what you need right now. Uh, Istio has a bunch of ways to mitigate that. You can turn it on, sort of Kubernetes namespace by Kubernetes namespace. You can extend. Um, what's called extend the mesh. So you can have a, a, an Istio mesh running in a Kubernetes cluster that also uh, talks to services on sort of VMs. So if you're on VMs and you're doing a lift and shift into containers, you can do a little bit of, you know, if you're, of your workload, put it in a couple of containers, put that in a cluster, have Istio in that cluster giving the, the advantage to them and then have it set up just so that it can still call out to the old legacy VM stuff. So there's ways to migrate um, incrementally. But yeah, I, I can't really help but say I think it's a great thing, and I think you should you should uh, you know try to get all of its benefits. And hopefully, it is more simple now than than people think. This you know, Istio is now version one point one. I know it it got a bad uh, reputation, maybe, but but those were the zero point one days. It was released very early mm-hmm. with a very clear zero point one label on, and I think it got so much hype, so much coverage. Everybody said, "Oh, it's great," but it is a bit buggy. Well. Yes, it said 0.1 on the tin, you know, and people just got carried away and tried to use it in production. Uh, I, you know, hopefully now you should have a much better time. Yeah, cool. Well, and then the good news is, you know, if people have questions on whether it's the right time or not, or are seeking for some advice, uh, we will definitely make sure to put all of your information on the podcast proceeding so that they can reach out to you. Because obviously you do have a lot of experience uh, in how to make companies cloud native or cloud native ready. And so we definitely, if it's okay with you, obviously we'll we'll uh, we'll direct them your way. Yeah, please. I mean, I'm personally always happy to have my, you know, my opinions challenged and and have debates with people and learn new information. So come find me on Twitter. I'm sure you'll you'll put that information up. And yeah, native exactly. native if you can help at a at a company level as well. Yeah, perfect. Brian, is there awesome. anything else from your end? No, I think uh, it might be time to go ahead and summon the good old summarizer. Do it now. So, folks, what I've learned today, I mean, there's obviously a whole lot to Istio. Uh, what, what helped me uh, in the explanation from Matt, which was, you know, phenomenal, uh, explaining the different pieces of the architecture, is just look at the architectural diagram, uh, see what Envoy is doing as the proxy that sits in front of all of your services, um, and then the control plane on top, which uh, makes sure to propagate the configuration uh, to the envoys, the mixer that is doing all the telemetry and then is doing real time, um, you know, configuration changes and traffic changes. And then also Citadel, which, you know, is one of the components for, um, for secure communication and I'm sure a lot of other things too. But uh, Matt, I think this was extremely useful for me. And also thanks for answering the questions on when it might not be the right time because we want to educate people on new technology, but we also want to make sure they understand when it might not be the right time. And if they're still uncertain, 
then obviously we will uh, direct them to some of the material that you put out there and also uh, make sure that people know where you where to find you. I know you are uh, traveling the world, four different conferences. Uh, we met in Romania. I know you are in Barcelona at KubeCon and I think there's other things coming up. Uh, by the time that this airs, uh, it's going to be July. And uh, I know you enjoy probably a nice quiet summer. But um, in case, you know, we have people that want to reach out to you and disturb your summer, we'll, again, still send them your way. <laughs> yeah, I think luckily I'll have uh, – conference season all came at once this year. Um, I think luckily I'll have safely got back to London before you, before this airs so uh, so nobody can find me. But, but no, of course, you know, reach out, <laughs> reach, reach, reach out online instead. Um, but hopefully this, you know, this kind of, I love talking about this stuff. I find it super interesting. Um, yeah. And I'd like to, as much as Native Wave would like to help people, you know, work out whether this stuff is right for them and, and implement it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a, a lot of it just comes down to, to education. If, if you understand the systems, what they're trying to do and, and you know, how they work, um, then you can make an informed decision to yourself as to whether it, it sounds right for you, you know, now. Um, so which is why I kind of go around talking about this stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. And in, in terms of people finding you, when Andy said, we're going to put where people can contact you, he did mean, you know, your home address, you know, <laughs> when you're going to be, when, when you're typically on the tube and all that. So. Well, well, yep. Come find me find on you. the, uh, <laughs> come find me on the bank branch of the Northern line, 8.30 AM every day. <laughs> if you can, uh, if you can elbow your way through the crowds, you're on the guy in the Kubernetes t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to thank you a ton for this because it really kind of really really solidified this all for me. And I, and I do uh, want to mention again, just stress again for anybody who um, wants to fit, you know completely wrap their head around this. Do as you know Andy suggested. Grab the architecture diagram, take the section where Matt talked about all that, and just look at that while he's talking because it really really solidifies it all. And I, and I think it just also goes to speak again. I, I brought this up on a previous podcast, Andy, about the maturity of all this stuff, um, you know, Kubernetes flourishing, taking off, um, and how now there are so many different services around these things in the earlier days of all this, you know, cloud native experimentations and all, it was all build your own. Uh, and you had to find the time to do it all yourself as well. But, but as you say, Matt, you know, you know, even your organization, there are services now around it. There are a lot of services around so many of these different aspects of it. It's really, really cool to see how mature this has become in so few years. So um, it, it's exciting times, I think. Yeah. And I could, you know, uh, I could talk all day about how Istio can do protocol translation on the wire and transparent database sharding and all of these things. And I think the technology has always been there and where people are just thinking of novel ways to use it. I don't think service yeah. meshes were ever designed to, to be transparent database sharding systems but actually if you, you think about it and you know how it works you can you can totally make it do that so i don't know whether anybody on the sto team saw that saw that coming two years ago but it's it's a thing so i think we're really just getting started with this kind of technology it's uh it's yeah. super exciting for, for me it sounds you're just introducing the net podcast the next podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh i signed up yeah, yeah. i well, think you are we haven't mentioned it in a while, but we, we, we used to have a running competition on repeat guests. I think the most we got up to was three or four, I forget. But yeah. uh, um, we, we just it was late to that. join the challenge. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, there's, um, a, yeah, there's, a, there's a bunch more stuff where it came from. So Awesome. Let's, let's see what people want to hear about. I'd be really interested to, to see the feedback on, uh, on this session. Yeah. What are you, uh, I have one, hopefully a quick one. What are you talking about at KubeCon? At KubeCon, I'm talking about one of the new features in Istio 1.1, uh, which is a way to basically make um, easy calls between service meshes. So if you've got two Kubernetes clusters in different regions, you absolutely want to run two copies of Istio you know, with a separate control plane each. Um, so a service in cluster A needs to be able to talk to a service in cluster B for whatever reason. You always could do that with Istio, um, I, but it, it was super complicated and I wrote like a blog and a config generator and stuff for it back in the day. Um, Istio 1.1 makes a lot of that first class, so I just kind of explained the theory behind that and then I'll do a, a demo of two two cube clusters, each with an Istio mesh, and then service in cluster A will be able to call, uh, you know, my, my backend dot cluster B dot global and it'll, it'll work up, it'll end up in the right place 
um, mm -hmm. routed via an ingress and egress gateway that can whitelist each other's IPs, end-to-end -end MTLS, uh, all of the good stuff of a service mesh, but uh, across across the globe, you know, for actual globally distributed um, distributed systems. Really cool. And uh, I think the recordings of KubeCon will be on YouTube so people can watch you. Probably by the time this airs, they will be able to see you live. Yeah, yeah, they get um, live. Yeah, they, they get them up. Uh, they get them up really quick. Live on tape. Yeah, and maybe if uh, I'll, I'll say, well, exactly. I'll, if the if the live demo doesn't work, I'll send you a frantic email and ask you to cut this section. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, enjoy wherever you are right now. <laughs> I mean, uh, I know it's evening for you. It is. I want to say I'm in I'm in uh, Vilnius, Lithuania. It's my first time here, and it's really nice. So I just wanted to plug Vilnius. Thanks to all the people in, yeah. you know, bars and restaurants have been friendly to me. It's a, it's a yeah. nice place. Speaking of feedback, you know, we would love to have Matt back on. We can have him back with or without feedback. But if any of our listeners have any feedback or other Istio topics they would like him to explore with us, please let us know. You can tweet us at pure underscore dt. Or send an old-fashioned email at pureperformance.dynatrace.com. Uh, Matt, thank you so very much. Andy, great to be on with you as always. And, Thanks for having uh, me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.